So let's say, imagine you see this question in some hypothetical situation. And let's say you don't remember any of the formulas. And this question is actually simple enough that if you remember some of the problem solving approaches that we have taught you in magnetism, you can actually do this from scratch. You don't, um, um, you don't need any memorized formulas. Although, you know, having formulas memorized is the short way to do it. So, so let me pretend that I don't know where to look up my formulas. And I definitely don't have the solenoid formula memorized. Or, you know, I have it memorized, but I'm going to pretend that I don't have it memorized. So, um, with that context, so it's asking me this. Uh, long cylindrical solenoid with some turns per centimeter has, okay, so it's, giving me the number of turns. I'm gonna need that. Let me give it a label N. Um, oh, turns per centimeter. So this is not actually um, N, this is N. Um, uh, well, uh, let me, well, N per L <laughs> per centimeter has a radius of uh, two centimeters. So this is the, uh, radius R of the one of the face of the solenoid, which I can use to calculate its area. Um, it says, uh, neglecting end effect, what is the self-inductance per centimeter of the solenoid? Oh, that's why it's asking it per centimeter because it doesn't actually tell me the length of the solenoid. So, so okay. Um, you have to start out with the expression for self-inductance. And you can write it in a couple different ways. And in the circuit to context, I like to write self-inductance this way, that um, in terms of the voltage change across the inductor, uh, where the, it's a self-inductance times di dt. So, so that's how I prefer to write. Let me... Um, go through a couple rewrite of this form to actually get to an expression that your textbook has. <laughs> and uh, I, I guess the value here is I'm showing you how these expressions are related. So, um, so the, the way I normally start out with, with the inductance is that inductance is the induced voltage. I'm just rewriting the expression above, divided by rate of change of current. And um, really what I mean by induced voltage here is from Faraday's law, what I'm really getting at is the rate of change of magnetic flux because these two are connected to each other through Faraday's law. So wherever I have uh, expression for induced voltage, uh, if I replace it with the rate of change of magnetic flux, it's the exact same thing. And um, with, you know, up to a sign, there's a minus sign there somewhere, but I'm just, let's just say I'm dealing with the absolute value of the thing. So change in magnetic flux divided by di dt. That's what that expression means. Now, this is these derivatives that, um, we don't actually have to deal with because this is a something that, um, why isn't it erasing? Oh, this is something that you will see 100% of the time with the inductors. When you have uh, some arrangement, some setup, a uh, solenoid. Oh, sorry, I'm drawing this in a hurry, so it's gonna look terrible, but this is my <laughs> quick sketch of a solenoid. <laughs> When you have a solenoid, and let's say you work out all the expressions for magnetic field, and you work out the expression for, okay, so you have some um, areas and you work out the expression for magnetic flux, and all of that is going to be a function of how much current is flowing through this wire. So, oops. I or that in an inconvenient place. Um, it's going to be a, a function of um, a current in the wire. 
And when you work this all out, this function, it happens to be, it's gonna be proportional to the current. It'll just work out to be that way. It, it, uh, I mean, you know, there's um, nothing inherent in the mathematics of the magnetic flux that says it has to be that way. But there's something in the physical setup that makes this uh, this statement just true 100% of the time. If you're looking for an analogy, an analogy would be uh, one for the capacitor. If you think back to the setup involving the capacitors, um, there the thing that you are interested in was the voltage difference between the plates and how they relate to the capacit uh, the amount of charges stored in the capacitor and the capacitance was defined as Q divided by V. And when you finish going through the derivation and everything, it always works out that amount of charge stored is proportional to voltage. Or you can look at it the other way, voltage is always proportional to the amount of charge. So that this ratio always worked out so that the dynamical quantity cancels out. And it's the same deal with the inductor that this, uh, um, this uh, magnetic flux is always gonna be proportional to the linear factor of current. And what that means is when I imagine taking this uh, derivative here, the magnetic flux, it's gonna depend on a whole bunch of uh, constant factors times uh, the current. So when I imagine taking the derivative time derivative here, all this constant factor stuff is gonna remain the same. And I'll just have time derivative of current. So whether you divide this time derivative uh, flux by time derivative of current, or if you do the mathematically simpler thing, take the flux itself and divide it by current, it's gonna give you the same answer. And that's why if you look at your textbook, your textbook will tell you that this is equal to the inductance. And sure, yeah, it's, it's always gonna work out that way. I mean, I prefer to dynamically think of, I prefer to think in these terms because this relates more naturally to circuits. So it's more useful to me. But um, if you just have to find the inductance and somehow if you are given all the parameters to figure out the magnetic uh, properties of the setup, then this is the simpler formula. You don't have to go through all these unnecessary derivatives and uh, unnecessary figuring out the voltage. You can just figure out, okay, what is my magnetic flux? Divide by current, that's it. Um, that's gonna be your thing. So, uh, so let me go through that here. So, um, so I guess my main task here is to figure out what is my magnetic flux through this solenoid. And what I'm gonna imagine doing, because I'm never given the quantity for the actual length of the, uh, in the solenoid, so I'm gonna imagine that this whole expression, I'm going to divide it by the length. <laughs> so I'm figuring out the inductance per length, which will uh, be related to the magnetic flux per length. So. And I guess the easier way to do this is to imagine that I have a one centimeter long solenoid, but um, uh, let me just um, not introduce unnecessary parameters. So, so yeah, um, so I need my first task here is to find the magnetic flux. And I think I'm gonna hope that when I'm done with that, Somehow, magically, it'll have a parameter that's linear in I, so I can just cancel it out. So the expression for magnetic flux, it's defined as the magnetic field times A. And I think I remember enough of uh, about enough of a solenoid to remember this, which is that magnetic field of a solenoid is uniform inside a solenoid. So I'm not even going to pretend to go through the whole, you know, uh, B dot DA integral, like uh, I don't need that. I know magnetic field inside the solenoid is really simple. So I'm gonna deal with the simple thing. And this is, you know, technically a dot product, but I also remember that magnetic field in the 
uh, solenoid points in one direction in this really simple way. And I, the area I'm considering is perpendicular to the magnetic field. So this dot product resolves to be something that's very simple, just the product of the magnitudes of these two vector quantities. Uh, the one thing I would have to be careful here is that um, this area is not the same area as the area of a single loop because um, you can work out the geometry if you want, but I guess the simpler version of it is basically each time this loop goes around, you so I count it once, count it twice, count it three times. So you have to, um, you have to, this area should be basically the cross section times the number of turns. And I think this gives me a good natural place to introduce the, the magnetic flux per length because um, this, uh, so cross-sectional area, I can get that from here easily. And instead of number of turns, I'm going to say number of turns per length, which is what I have here, M per L. So, um, so this uh, expression is going to morph into <laughs> magnetic flux per length is equal to magnetic field times the area, which uh, let me just write out in terms of the given quantity there, pi r squared times um, the number of turns per length, so n over l. Or I guess the more standard way to write is actually this n over l. Uh, usually we give it lowercase n. That's the number of the standard notation for number of turns per length. So let me do the same thing here, just lowercase n, and that's gonna be my number of turns per centimeter. So, okay, um, I still don't have an I yet. I guess I need to work out what the expression for this magnetic field is to have an expression for current sum here that I'm gonna cancel out. And um, this is where you have to <laughs> um, either look up the formula for magnetic field of a solenoid, which I guess I do have it memorized. Let me just uh, write it on the side as a proof that I have it memorized. It's a mu naught and I. So either look it up, have it memorized, or if you don't have it memorized, you can actually drive it using Ampere's law. And it's one of the ones that are easier to drive than most. As long as you remember the, the configuration of the magnetic field that you remember um, the magnetic field inside is uniform. And I guess uh, if you remember that magnetic field outside is zero, that makes your derivation a little bit easier. Uh, it, uh, so, um, so this is the quick derivation using Ampere's law. So when you have this picture of the current, Really the thing that you are interested in is, let me uh, set the direction so that the magnetic field here is going into the page. I think that's consistent with the magnetic current. Here is going into the page. That's consistent with the direction of magnetic field I have drawn. So the Amperian loop that you consider to uh, figure out the magnitude of the magnetic field inside is this loop here. You, so inside you want something that's uh, straight and parallel to the magnetic field. So this is my segment of height h. And I take a turn uh, perpendicular to the magnetic field so that I don't collect any line integral as I come out. And outside here, I can um, just, I'm trying to close the loop. And here, since the magnetic field is zero, I don't need to worry too much about um, the path out here. And I have this path to turn perpendicular again so that I can close the loop at the bottom here. So I, so I made all the symmetry argument to say that the magnetic field inside is uniform and outside I just know that magnetic field is zero. Uh, watch the lecture where I actually prove it. And um, with that, I'm ready to apply Ampere's law, which says that this uh, line integral of B dot DL around the closed loop is equal to, and I'm just gonna stick with permeability constant. 
it says uh, it's mu naught times the current uh, enclosed or enclosed. And um, the left-hand side is where you use the symmetry argument to make it simple. Along this segment, it's zero. Along this segment, zero, zero. Really, the only segment you have to worry about is this segment here, and that's just magnetic field times the height h. So the left-hand side be, turns out to be rather simple as magnetic field times h. So that's equal to mu naught times. And this is where you have to figure out the current enclosed. So, um, so I'm enclosing some number of these loops. And the number of these loops that I'm including is related to the number of turns per centimeter times the height. So the current that's included would be the actual current that's flowing, that's current per wire, times the number of wires I'm including, which is the number of turns per height or length times the height or length. And you see that H cancels out, which is great because that's an arbitrary parameter that I don't want in my final expression. And you get magnetic field is mu naught I N, which is what I had memorized. <laughs> so, so with that, you see that, oh, now we finally have current that we can cancel out. So it's a uh, mu naught and uh, let me write n squared since I have two factors of n times pi r squared. I have that and I need to finish writing down i. So for the inductance, it's uh, the magnetic flux divided by i. So I get inductance is equal to mu naught or inductance per length, <laughs> mu naught times n squared times pi r squared. So that's it. All the parameters here are either given or are um, are um, are uh, physical constants. So it should all work out. I guess um, you do have to be careful with the units. And what I would recommend is. Um, I don't know, turn everything into basic SI unit first so that it's a number of turns per meter and radius is in meters, work it out in terms of Henry's per meter and then to the uh, fact power of 10 conversion. That's the, uh, that's the way to ensure that there isn't any mistake relating to power of 10. So, so uh, once you have that, then I think induced voltage is much simpler. Um, yeah, it, it's giving me the rate of current change. It's giving me di dt. So, oh, so you just go back to this expression here. What you have is the inductance per length. So if you just multiply that with the di dt, that'll give you a voltage change per length. So yeah, that's the long way to do it. It could have been done in five minutes, but redriving all these formulas took 20 minutes. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not necessarily saying that you should do it the long way. It's that um, it's a good way to test how much physics that we covered a few weeks earlier in the semester that you still remember, understood. And uh, it's not the sort of thing that I can make you do, but it's something that I would do. Recommend that you try it for your own, uh, own edification. <laughs>